Hello guys. So now that we finished diuretics, this is a longer lecture on hypertension, um, but right now we're focusing on medications and I'm breaking them down by classes, um, hopefully to help to, um, you know, your brain to process things a little bit at a time. Um, so um, the next type of class that we might use for um, patients with hypertension are going to be your alpha and your beta blocker. So these are all medications that work um, against the sympathetic nervous system. So you know, we talked about one of the um, associated risk factors with hypertension can be that they have, um, uh, you know, too much sympathetic nervous system activity. Also, you know, just um, stress, other things can activate it, um, the stress response system, things like that, or they might have other disease processes that um, are stimulating this. So this is great for people that their main problem is the sympathetic nervous system is activated. But even regardless of that, even if you're not someone whose sympathetic nervous system is constantly activated, you're not in nursing school, um, this also can um, be good for anyone because the way that most of these work, especially the alpha blockers work more in the blood vessels. Um, both of them work in the blood vessels, but the alphas are solely in the blood vessels. Um, and alpha blockers can help um, to decrease um, resistance in the blood vessels, relax them. Remember, they're real like tense and tight, the blood vessels. So they help to relax them. Um, and then beta blockers can help work in the blood vessels and relax them, um, but it also can decrease your heart rate as well. Now, keep in mind, I'm not really giving a beta blocker for someone with hypertension to decrease their heart rate, um, but this is why beta blockers can also be used for dysrhythmias. It can be used for fast heart rhythms. Now, if you go really deep, you could look at like, hey, if someone... Um, uh, what do you call it? If someone's heart's going really fast and working really hard, you know, that decreased heart rate may help and improve their blood pressure. But um, as a whole, I really don't want you going that deep. Um, we're not sitting there and, and going that deep when we're prescribing these, uh, when not we are, the doctor's prescribing these things. Um, what's really going on here is, is the doctor is, uh, the, the doctor, you know, all right, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop, I'm getting deep into the story. But um, what's really happening here is we're giving these medications to relax relax the blood vessels. That's like the really straightforward way of looking at it. Now, don't get too crazy and think where on the smooth muscle of the blood vessel is this happening. You don't have to go that deep. It's really just understanding these are going to relax the blood vessels. Um, but it is good to know that beta blockers do, um, just like there's double Bs, there's double drops. So they drop your heart rate and your blood pressure, but we'll get to that. So let's first talk about alpha blockers. Um, so some of these, uh, like, I'll be honest, I've maybe seen an alpha blocker once in my career. And it's just, you know, the patient's, that I'm taking care of are more critically ill. So that a lot of times they're on IV or other meds. So I'm not saying it's not used. I'm sure it is used, but it's not necessarily the first med that's going to be used. Um, the things to know about alpha blockers that are different. Oh no, I have a changed position slowly on here. I thought I got rid of all of them. Oh, you know, all my hard work gone to waste. I thought I got all of all the orthostatic hypotension out, but I missed one. Anyway, we'll see how many more I missed as we go forward. Um, so um, the big thing with alpha blockers um, is, is that they help to decrease that resistance in the blood vessels, but um, they also can lead to more drowsiness and a little bit more profound orthostasis. Um, so it's recommended that they take uh, take their medication at bedtime, especially the first dose, and that's going to decrease their risk of that orthostatic um, effect. So that's the only th really thing that is different is, is think of, um, you know, dizziness and drowsiness. Um, we're going to add in another D for the alpha-2 adrenergic agonist. Now, even though it says it's an agonist, which usually means it supports, the way that alpha-2 work, they actually block sympathetic nervous system activity um, on the blood vessels. So this is when you're actually probably going to see given pretty regularly. It's what's known as clonidine. Um, it can be given oral or it can be given by patch. Um, and the benefit of that is, is, you know, some patients are very non-compliant with their meds. So a patch lasts longer. Um, the patch can stay on for a few days usually. And, um, uh, it can lead to, um, you know, a better compliance because people don't like taking pills. Um, so, but just like the alpha one, this can lead to drowsiness and dizziness. Um, but the other D that this can lead to, so the alpha two actually is a triple D in that it's drowsiness, dizziness, and dry mouth. Um, so just like we talked about with antihistamines, uh, remember some little cumulative studying here, um, is, um, think about for, um, 
uh, what do you call it for, for this one, it's the same teaching that we did for antihistamines, where you're going to use gum or hard candy um, to relieve their dry mouth if they're having issues with it. Um, you know, you might say like, ooh, if they're having a dry mouth, give them more fluids. But you want to think about if I have a patient with hypertension, do I want them drinking a whole lot of extra fluids? No, it's not that they're on a fluid restriction, but they don't need excess. Um, we want to uh, make sure that we tell them not to take it with other sedatives because it's going to make them even more drowsy. And specifically with this one, it can have a profound rebound effect. So we do not want to stop it suddenly. Um, you know, the story that I always tell with that is, is that I had a patient come in once and they admitted and they were like, yeah, you know, we think he has an infection. He's septic. His blood pressure super low. None of the meds are working to get his blood pressure up. And so they brought him to me and, you know, done the ER and I'm not no disrespect to ER nurses, but you know, their, their job is not to sit there and do a deep head to toe assessment and check every inch of their skin. Um, but this man, you know, I turned him over, um, you know, to assess the skin on his back. Back, and um, he was covered in clonidine patches. He had three or four clonidine patches on. And um, so the only really reason and why he had three or four clonidine patches on, he shouldn't have. Um, but, you know, it's not like a fentanyl patch that would have, you know, brought pain relief. Um, the, clonidine can be used in some psychiatric situations, but most of the time it's for blood pressure. Um, you know, like there's some alpha two and alpha one stuff that can be used for other reasons, but, um, yeah, needless to say. So I took these patches off this man. And then of course, like his blood pressure skyrocketed about up. He didn't need any more meds. And I transferred him out of the unit, like later that shift. Um, cause the only problem he really had, he was not septic. He had no infection. He just had too much blood pressure medicine on his back. Um, so once we took it off, there was a steep rise eyes in his blood pressure. So, um, yeah, always check your patient's skin all, uh, you know, even in places you would least expect to find something, you'd be surprised what you find in the folds. So let's look at this scenario. A client is taking clonidine 0.1 milligrams PO and are reporting a dry mouth and dizziness when they change positions. What is the best action by the nurse? So um, anytime that people have side effects, I've talked about in other videos, you always want to worry about side effects that are going to cause a patient to be non-compliant. And you want to think about side effects that are going to cause um, a problem. So you have to think, you always want to look at this. Okay, is this a side effect that's expected? And I need to tell, I don't, I'm not going to tell them suck it up, but I'm going to tell them like, hey, how, here's how you can manage this so you can keep taking this med. Um, so with the dry mouth, again, we can tell them the hard candy, lozenge, things like that. Um, uh, the dizziness though. So what is that dizziness? Remember, that's like that orthostatic hypotension. So what can I tell them? Hmm. I'm going to tell them to change positions slowly. Um, so, um, I, they can, they should still keep taking this medication. Um, but I'm going to tell them these side effects are expected now. And any patient times a patient complains of dizziness, I still check their blood pressure, make sure they're doing okay. Cause keep in mind, we haven't talked about it yet, but there are some times that, um, we're going to need to hold blood pressure medications. Um, and so you always want to think about that. And generally, like, I'll, I'll give you kind of a little, uh, a, a little, uh, I was going to call it a, um, treat or I was going to call it like a was it a sneak peek um that um the the when someone when I'm taking someone's blood pressure before giving a blood pressure med generally uh, it depends every doctor's different and you always want to look at your orders because they sometimes write specific parameters um but generally if the the systolic blood pressure is less than 100 um or if I'm monitoring heart rate and clonidine is not one we have to monitor heart rate but for beta blockers we monitor heart rate usually if it's less than 60 I'm going to hold the med um, so I would probably also still check their blood pressure, just make sure it's okay. But if it is okay, then I would just tell them, hey, you might just be having orthostatic hypotension, um, change position slowly, and then here's a lozenge so that your mouth ain't so dry. All right, now let's go into beta blockers. And because you guys love complications, I'm here to tell you there are multiple classes of beta blockers. Um, but this is gonna seem confusing when you first look at it. But I hear, I'm gonna stop saying, but I'm here to tell you that it's not as bad as what it looks like. Um, so let's kind of keep it simple. I have a lot of mnemonics and stuff here. So it might look like there's a lot here, but really beta blockers, the big thing to know is, is that there are, cardio selective and then non cardio selective and really what this comes down to is that for beta blockers um, the way that they work there's beta cells in the heart and the lungs some beta cells um, are just stationed in the heart and some are in the lungs and the heart um, so cardio selective beta blockers block 
um, receptors that are just in the heart. And so this is really ideal um, because if someone has respiratory disorders or other things, if I block beta in the lungs, sometimes it can lead to a sudden bronchoconstriction. So we'll talk about this, but with the non-selective, I'm a little bit more worried about like asthma patients and um, people that have constrictive airway disease, people that are smokers, things like that. But we'll talk more about it. But cardioselective is usually what you're going to see given. And, and metoprolol is one of the most common meds you're going to see given um, probably in your life, if, especially if you do cardiac, come on over, water's warm. Um, but, um, you know, you're, you're going to see cardioselective preferred because there are, you know, less risks and stuff like that with bronchospasm. Um, but there are some concerns. The one thing is, is compared to all the other meds we've talked about so far, this one doesn't just lower your blood pressure. It also lowers your heart rate. So now there's two parameters I need to check before I give this medication. Um, so, uh, what do you call it? What's going to be different is it lowers the heart rate. And then we also want to be worried about patients that not worried. I don't want to say it like this bad thing. We want to, we want to maybe check in with the doctor or do more frequent checks for patients that are diabetic. Um, so the thing to consider here, we talked about this back when we talked about diabetes is that a patient who, um, is having issues with their, um, sorry, a patient that is taking like metoprolol, we'll say for instance, um, they uh, are taking it for their hypertension. And maybe the point of it is they want their blood pressure lower. As a side effect to it lowers their heart rate. You have to go back to what it looks like when a patient has a low blood sugar. So let's back up a little bit um, uh, cause maybe I'm putting the cart before the horse. So let's back up. So hypoglycemia, patient's diabetic, hypoglycemic. Um, normally when I'm hypoglycemic, my body is going to send me cues. Hey, go eat a snack. My heart's going to start racing. Um, you know, my, um, you know, we talked about like the cold and clammy, give me candy. My heart starts racing. I'm really nervous, anxious, diaphoretic. These are all those signs. Well, that's a sympathetic nervous system reaction. Remember now, what are we doing here with beta blockers? We are blocking a sympathetic nervous system reaction. So if I'm giving a beta blocker to a patient who's also diabetic, um, while yay, their blood pressure is down, it's also going to lower their heart rate, which it's also going to block that sympathetic nervous system reaction. So if they're getting hypoglycemic, that could be blocked. In other words, like this patient um, could end up having a low blood glucose, but they don't have all the signals in their body that normally tell them they're not sweating. They're not, their heart's not racing. They're not feeling anxious because their sympathetic nervous system is not responding in the same way because it's being blocked by this medication. Um, so it's not that a patient with that's diabetic cannot get this medication, but we may just talk to the physician, like, cause all beta blockers do this, by the way, I should mention this all beta blockers. We worry about di um, like diabetes and, um, you know, masking hypoglycemia. Um, also, I will mention this is that, you know, new, more, more recent research has shown that all beta blockers can also at some level, uh, I don't know what, if I want to say a grand statement like that, but many beta blockers have been shown to, um, also cause a decrease in blood glucose in general, just in their mechanism of action and how they work in the body. So there is going to be a little bit of concern, um, for someone who is, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, diabetic where I might want to watch their blood sugars more frequently. I might need to like look more carefully for the signs of hypoglycemia. So don't think the caution in diabetes is just for cardioselective. It's for all of them. And again, in my head, my wheels are turning. Oh, you should have structured these PowerPoints differently, but another day, another time. Um, and like I mentioned, since it, since it lowers your heart rate, check your pulse before administration. If a patient's um, going home on this med, then you know how to take their pulse. Um, and if we're going to hold it, usually for a heart rate less than 60. Now, again, in the hospital, always check your order. Don't just say, well, Woodruff said heart rate less than 60. I'm not a doctor. Um, thank you, Jesus. All right, let's take a moment of silence. I'm not a doctor. Hallelujah. Um, so um, I, uh, what do you call it? It's not, this is not my rule, but in general, we're never usually going to give a um, beta blocker for less than 60. Now with me saying that I was actually with a student the other day, Hey JV, I'm talking about you. Um, uh, you know, and we were giving a beta blocker and their heart rate was like 61, 60. And we looked at the orders and it said, hold if less than 55. So again, the doctors can decide this because maybe some people run a little low, um, you know, and maybe some people, they don't want their heart rate down that. So, so I've seen it before where it's like hold if heart rate less than, uh, or uh, less than uh, 70 or something like that. So it just depends. Anyway, um, that's the big thing. The only other thing I want to bring up is, is that students are always like, well, how am I going to know if it's cardioselective or not? Well, I'll tell you this is that um, there, I, I found this online somewhere. So some creative genius came up with this, but generally, generally, 
all cardio selective beta blockers are going to be A through M. There's there's two exceptions there when we talk about mixed, but we'll get there. Um, so it's going to be things like atenolol, metoprolol, um, whereas all of your oh there's a medication sorry all of your non selectives are N through Z. We're going to get there. So anyway, let's go back here. All right, so a client is on metoprolol. I don't know why it says metoprolol I. Uh, metoprolol, 25 milligrams PO daily. Their current blood pressure is 90 over 65. What action should the nurse take? Sorry, I'm looking for my water here. As my, I feel my throat getting dry. So I have a patient that's on metoprolol, which is going to lower their heart rate and their blood pressure. Their current blood pressure is 90 over 65. What should I do? Um, so this is going to be one of those cases where their blood pressure is low. And like I said, usually the threshold is going to be less than 100. Um, so if their blood pressure is less than 100, I'm usually going to hold it. Um, the reason you want, like you want to follow very carefully, because uh, if, if you start to go outside the parameters the doctor gives you or generally safe parameters, you can always call and check in if you're not sure, because sometimes doctors do not put parameters in. So sometimes I call and check, but you want to be very careful that you're not practicing medicine. Um, so I've seen many nurses um, do this before, is that like a patient's blood pressure is like one. 20 and they're like oh their blood pressure is good they don't need their blood pressure meds but you always want to remember their blood pressure may be good because they're getting their blood pressure med i cannot decide as a nurse their blood pressure is good enough um i'm not going to give their med it's perfect where it is um and a lot of times nurses do this because they're afraid of giving it that it's going to drop too low but keep in mind there's times that i've had a patient with the blood pressure of like 130 something i give them four meds and their blood pressure is still 130 or goes down to 120 so you don't know um you know a lot of times it can be scary, especially as a new nurse. Um, but if you have a concern, call the doctor and say, hey, are these all okay to give? Um, or definitely maybe first check in with your charge nurse or your preceptor if you're still in training. Um, you know, just kind of see, because you have to kind of get a feel for things. And sometimes we give things, if they have a really low drop in their blood pressure, they obviously need to change their medication regimen. Um, but, um, you know, you, you can't, and I'm not saying just blindly given and say, well, the doctor doesn't have parameters. It's in the parameters. I'm going to give it, you know, you always want to use your critical thinking, but I'm just cautioning you not to practice medicine and decide whether a patient should or should not get a medicine based on what you think or how you think they're going to respond. Um, we always use our judgment. So, um, like for example, I had a patient, um, the other night who, um, had was on, um, they were in, we had made them MPO cause we were pulling out their breathing tube. And so then, um, it was time to give them their nightly insulin. We actually got their breathing tube out. Um, it was time to give their nightly insulin. They were due for long acting and they were due for a pretty hefty dose of long acting. Um, but they didn't have any tube feeds or anything going anymore. So I talked to the doctor, like I used my judgment. I said, Hey, do you want to put a feeding tube in and we can start feeding her again so that I can, you know, I'm about to give some insulin. Um, and even though long acting insulin doesn't have a peak and stuff like that, I don't want her to have any drops. So I'm using my judgment there, but I'm not just sitting there and being like, Oh, I'm going to hold this insulin because she's not eating anything. So she doesn't need it. And her blood sugars have been fine. Um, or I'm not going to also decide to just go ahead and give it without like thinking through what could happen next. So you do want to think about it, but I'm just cautioning you not to um, get into a role on either side of things where you're, you know, playing doctor. Um, cause it's definitely not a, uh, it's not a fun outcome usually. All right, so now let's talk about non-cardio selective beta blockers. Um, so these all end with N to Z. And so the most common one you're probably going to see, there's like natalol, but there's also propranolol. That's probably going to be the most common one you're going to hear about that is a non-cardio selective. Um, same thing as the other beta blockers. Lowers heart rate, hold for less than 60. They need to know how to take their pulse, lower their blood pressure too. The only thing that's different about this one is that um, on top of already, you know, I should say also same with diabetes, it can mask the symptom of hypoglycemia because it blocks that heart rate increase um, that people get with hypoglycemia. But the thing that's different about this one compared to the cardio selective is that I also want to use caution in constrictive airway disease like asthma COPD. Um, for some doctors, it might actually be a contraindication. So if I found out at a later time that a patient has asthma, I would probably want to you know, call the doctor and make sure they were aware that the patient has asthma and they're about to receive a non-cardio selective. Um, this is something where I would probably hold off, call the physician, check in, um, because it could lead to bronchospasm or closure of their airway, which leads to death. Um, last but not least, there's also what are known as mixed alpha and beta. And so this is where I said that that A through M and N through Z rule like doesn't apply. Um, so there's two meds and one of these you're going to see given a lot. It's what's called Carvedilol. 
Um, and there's also La Beta Law. Um, so this, this, these two meds, they seem like they would fit in the cardio selective, but both of these are mixed, which means they have a little bit of alpha, like we talked about alpha blockers, and they also have a beta, a beta blocker. And this is a great, uh, this is a med cho chosen a lot because it combines meds. Instead of them having to take two separate meds, they can take it in one, um, and it does have good effectiveness. Um, but when you think of mixed alpha and beta, instead of sitting there and like going in your head and saying, oh my God, how am I going to remember three different classes? this looks exactly like the one we just did and it's the exact same thing it lowers the heart rate caution and diabetes caution and restrictive airway diseases take the pulse prior heart hold for heart rate less than 60 is the same so treat um these mixed alpha beta so i'm purposely trying to go back but i i move too soon so treat the mixed alpha and beta the same that you would treat the non-selective um, not cardio selective um, beta blockers um, so they are the same so think it's the exact same thing so don't be going and getting crazy and making 15 different cards um, you know we can't really um, aside from the names we can't really tell you any difference between these two because effectively they're going to have the same precautions same nursing interventions the only one that's going to be different is this cardio selective that i'm not concerned about that asthma copd patient because it does not um, have a, that same risk of bronchoconstriction all right, so a client is on Carvedilol 3.125 milligrams PO daily and are diabetic. Their current blood glucose is 75. What action should the nurse take? So um, this is one of those things that you want to think about. Like, you know, we've talked about with diabetes that it can block a blood sugar drop. It also can potentially lower the blood glucose. Um, so for this, it's not that I have to be like, they need to eat 15 grams of carbs or they have to have a meal before this. Um, but probably with this patient, their blood glucose is 75. It's getting closer to hypoglycemia. It's going to depend on the patient, but um, definitely I would want to one, make sure that we're monitoring their blood glucose closely. Um, but I would want to um, check a blood glucose shortly after giving this. I would probably want them to eat a snack or something else um, in general, just to get their blood glucose up. Cause that's, I mean, that looks like a beautiful blood glucose. Yes. Um, once we hit 70, um, you know, we're starting to get into hypoglycemia territory. Um, so in general, it looks like they probably need a snack anyway. Um, and then um, uh, what do you call it with this medication? We just need more frequent monitoring. So really a question like this is checking, is it safe to give? And yes, it is safe to give that med because there's nothing, it's not that I'm going to give the Carvedilol and it's like insulin and it's going to drop them by a hundred points. Um, but uh, it is possible that they could have an interaction or if, and if they have that interaction, if they start to have a hypoglycemia, um, then we're going to be concerned because they're not going to show the same symptoms they normally would show. So close monitoring and then just making sure that they're, um, you know, keep it. I don't need to keep their blood sugar super high or anything crazy like that. Um, but, um, we definitely want to make sure that we're, um, we're not too, um, we're not getting too close to the hypoglycemia territory. I think that's it. Okay. All right. So that is it for, um, alpha and beta blockers. I hope this was helpful. See you for vasodilators next.